Today I want to talk about the operational parameters of your freeze dryer. Not um, how to freeze dry something, but what you need to know about why your freeze dryer works the way it does and what you need to be looking out for to ensure that your freeze dryer is operating at optimum performance. There's a lot that I didn't know when I first got my freeze dryer. I was just like everybody else that was just getting into freeze drying. I brought the unit home, I set it up, I stood back and I looked at it. I knew that it was set up properly and I proceeded to, to freeze dry things. And uh, unfortunately though, my freeze dryer had a problem, but I had nothing to compare it against and nobody ever told me what the operational parameters of the freeze dryer are. And there was no real manual that came with the freeze dryer to tell you what I'm gonna tell you now. I'm Evan Rowell, and this is Critical Thinking about freeze dryer operational parameters. All right, to begin with, let's talk about what happens in a freeze dryer. When I was young and first heard about the process of freeze drying, it sounded like an oxymoronic term to me, which means how could you talk about drying something when it's frozen? And if you're like most people, you're under the impression that there are three states of water, which there are, but those three states had to pass between one another. In other words, ice couldn't become a vapor without melting first, without becoming water. Or a vapor couldn't condense directly into ice, which it can, uh, without first becoming water. And that water, um, that temperature, was the determining factor between whether or not um, water was going to become a vapor or become ice and which at a constant atmospheric pressure that may be true. But let's consider just exactly what is water. Water is a compound of molecules, hydrogen and oxygen, that depending upon atmospheric pressure and temperature will either be in a, um, a solid state because the molecules are releasing so little energy and the atmospheric pressure is great enough on the molecules that it crushes them together and it makes it so that they won't move uh, relative one to another and that is um, that's ice okay now when temperature begins to rise above 32 degrees Fahrenheit the energy of those exterior molecules the molecules on the very outside will begin to agitate and they'll begin to be able to rub or flow against each other instead of being solid and when that happens the water molecules begin to slough off into a liquid and the ice begins to melt now before i go any further i i have to indicate a disclaimer here there is a lot of science that goes into this if you wanted to talk, really get into uh, fluid dynamics and terms like uh, vapor pressures and atmospheric pressures and, and all that kind of stuff, you could, I mean, there's a whole science wrapped up in this stuff. So I'm being very, very general here so that you can understand basically what happens. All right, so when um, ice becomes water because those molecules are rubbing against each other, they become fluid, but they're not breaking completely apart. All right, you have to apply a sufficient energy source, and in this case, heat, to cause those molecules to get so excited that they will actually break off from the mass and become a vapor. All right, most people, like I say, believe that it has to be one of the three stages, and they have to pass back and forth uh, between all three stages. Well, they don't. In a freeze dryer, the process of removing moisture from food happens by something called sublimation. And in the most simple way of putting this, sublimation is actually the process of evaporating ice. And the process of sublimation, I'm quite sure you've experienced it in your own lifetime, you've seen it happen, uh, you just don't know that it's happening. Uh, you don't understand. I want you to look at this picture. Here you have a picture of two ice cubes, okay? The ice cube on the left has been frozen for eight months. The ice cube on the right has only been frozen for 12 hours. 
Uh, the difference between these two is both of these ice cubes were initially uh, frozen in the same tray. So the ice cube on the left used to be as big as the ice cube on the right. Now the ice cube on the left was never taken out of the, my deep freezer. In, for eight months it was sitting in the back there. It was never exposed to temperatures below 20 degrees below zero, but it still shrank through the process of sublimation. And how that happens it is the, uh, what's important to sublimation is not necessarily the temperature, but the difference of temperature between the ice and the surrounding atmosphere. The difference can be only 20 degrees, and you're going to get some sublimation off of that ice, which is the molecules, the water molecules on the surface of the ice, um, Forced, uh, being forced to break free from the ice and become a vapor, it, a, a frozen vapor nonetheless, but it, it's a vapor. And over time, that will happen often enough to where the ice cube will actually begin to shrink. And the reason that that happens is if you open up the door to your freezer and close it and open it and close it and open it, and the more you do that, the more often that you're letting in that room temperature air. That room temperature air envelops the ice cube or everything else inside the deep freezer for that matter and that difference in temperature around the outside of the ice cube from what the temperature of the actual ice cube is will be sufficiently different to cause sublimation now it happens all the time and I'm quite sure you've seen it if you own a freezer have you ever taken a piece of meat out of your freezer and noticed that it was freezer burned all right well here's a picture of some hamburger that has been freezer burned and what happens is sublimation has caused the moisture in the hamburger. And you can see it on the right side, the lower right side a little bit, that hamburger that looks kind of light colored and dried and everything. That is freezer burned. But you might say, hey, Evan, what do you mean? You can still see ice covering it. Well, that's not ice that was ever originally part of the meat. That is ice that condenses on the meat. Um, every time you open up the refrigerator and let in some warm air, you're going to get some condensation on that uh, piece of meat and it's going to form a frost but that doesn't mean that the moisture content of the meat itself is where it needs to be and hasn't sublimated off okay so you can take a piece of freeze-dried meat and it'll have frost on it but it'll be absolutely dry on the inside as you can see in this picture sublimation happens all over the world um, if you've ever been to an arctic area that uh, experiences differences in you know night and day and the temperature will go up and down but the temperature never gets above the freezing point sometimes in the summertime it'll, it'll get just above zero you'll notice that the ground is frozen solid but it is also very very dry and the air that is blowing over the land is also very very dry and that's because the night the differences in temperature of night and day have caused the ice or the moisture in the ground even though it is constantly frozen to sublimate. Sublimation is something we live with and sublimation is something that the freeze dryer is able to cause to happen relatively quickly. Okay, the second thing that you need to know is what we alluded to in the beginning is that temperature is not the only determining factor when it comes to the state of water atmospheric pressure is. Now let's talk about the boiling point of water. Did you know that water doesn't have to be hot to boil? The boiling point of water is dependent upon the atmospheric pressure around it. Now I live at a high altitude. Okay, I live in the Rocky Mountain area and for me boiling water is done at about 206-207 uh, degrees. But if you were to take that same water and take it down to the ocean front at sea level that atmospheric pressure is going to increase sufficiently that it's going to boil at about 212 degrees. Now that may not seem like very much. However, if you take that same water to the top of Mount Everest, that's over 29,000 feet above sea level. It will boil at 160 degrees. If you take that same water into outer space, it will just boil away. Now I did a little experiment not too long ago. I took a, a a cup of water I put it in the freeze dryer and turned on the vacuum pump and as soon as that vacuum started to draw the water inside of that cup 
began to boil immediately and there was no added heat. So the second, so remember the first thing is that ice can evaporate and the second thing is that um, water's boiling point is dependent on atmospheric pressure just as much as it is on temperature. Now the third thing that you need to keep in mind so that you can understand how a freeze dryer works is that radiant heat cannot pass through a vacuum. Radiant heat needs to be transferred from one solid to another to another to another in order to transfer away from its source. Now you might say, well Evan, what about the sun? The sun has to travel through 96 million miles to reach the earth. Well, fact of the matter is, the sun's radiant heat doesn't go any further than its corona. You ever get inside the sun's corona and you will disappear, you will evaporate, you will disintegrate. Almost instantly the temperatures will be so high. But that corona is relatively close to the surface of the sun. So the question comes then, well then what is it that heats the earth if the radiant heat can't reach the earth? Well, radiant heat can't, but infrared energy can travel through a vacuum. And as infrared energy travels from the sun to the surface of the earth, the surface of the earth can convert it into radiant heat. So anyhow, when it comes to freeze drying, that is going to be something that you're going to want to consider when I move into how the freeze dryer actually works and what its parameters are. So let's go ahead and go there. Now the first thing that you want to consider when you get your freeze dryer is its physical location in your house or wherever it is that you're going to put it. Temperature is critical. As you will learn later on in this video, that freeze dryer barrel needs to be able to get down to as low as 50 degrees below zero. And surrounding ambient temperature in a room uh, plays an important role in your freeze dryer's ability to do that. Optimum temperature for your freeze dryer or ambient temperature of the room is 72 degrees or colder. It doesn't matter if, if it gets colder than that, but when the temperature starts to rise, then you can run into some problems. And if the temperature gets upwards of, of 86, 87, you know, 90 degrees, and sometimes that'll happen if your freeze dryer is in a location like your garage, the freeze dryer can fail simply because the refrigeration unit can't keep up with the demand. Okay, so if your ambient room temperature is about 72 degrees, your freeze dryer should work fine without any kind of a fan or anything on it. I keep a fan on mine either way because I find that it works better. But at 72 degrees, you really don't need a fan. If your ambient room temperature gets up around 78, 79, or 80 degrees, then you need to put a fan on your vacuum pump and circulate the air around the outside of your freeze dryer. Because, you know, your freeze dryer, that um, refrigeration unit develops heat also. And if, uh, if that little fan in there can't cool down that um, condenser unit sufficiently to where the temperatures can be brought down to where they need to be, then your freeze dryer can fail. Okay, because if your ambient room temperature is approaching 90 degrees and that freeze dryer is also developing heat and your pump is also developing heat, that freeze dryer and pump, the air around it can be enveloped in um, heat that gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And I've had this happen when I first got my freeze dryer, it was in the garage and the first day that the temperature outside was 90 degrees, boy, you should have seen how badly that freeze dryer failed. But anyhow, location is important. Make sure that you are putting your freeze dryer in the coolest location that you can because um, that will facilitate optimum performance. Okay, you got the freeze dryer set up. You've got food in your trays, be it uh, three, four, five, depending upon the size of your freeze dryer. Oh, and that's, that's something else. I own a medium-sized freeze dryer. So what I'm going to describe to you here, although the, is going to be basically good information for all three freeze dryers, uh, it might vary a little bit from freeze dryer to freeze dryer. And it might vary a little bit depending upon your atmosphere and the surrounding temperature of your freeze dryer, you know, your room temperature. You can't have it too hot. So there are going to be uh, some variances, but not enough to invalidate anything that I'm going to tell you now, okay? So the first thing, 
you're going to do is you're going to take the food, you're going to put it in your freeze dryer, you're going to start the process, and the freeze dryer will begin to freeze it. It, it goes through a, a, a pre-freeze thing. We, it tells you wait 15 minutes before you put the food in, and, and we'll get into that. But anyhow, so you start your freeze dryer, and you begin to watch it. Now, the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to go into a freezing mode, okay? Now, your freeze dryer, when it goes into the freezing mode, is not going to turn on the vacuum, your vacuum pump, and that's important. Because remember I said radiant heat can't travel through a vacuum? Well, if there was a vacuum inside of there, it would be very difficult for the barrel, which is going to get 20, 30, 40, even as much as 50 degrees below zero, to actually cool the tray. Because in order for it to cool the tray, the, tray, the heat on the tray has to be able to radiate off, and if there's no air in there, it can't radiate off. So the vacuum pump's not going to turn on right away, and you may go into a freezing cycle for anywhere from uh, 5 to 12, 14 hours. Uh, the computer's going to sense the temperature of the tray, which, incidentally, you need to understand that that temperature that you're seeing on your screen is not the temperature of the barrel. Okay, that temperature you're seeing on the screen is the temperature of the, of the tray because it is the tray that has the temperature monitor on it. So in most cases, if your freeze dryer is operating properly, the barrel is going to be a lot colder than that tray. But even then, during the freezing process, the temperature of that tray can get down to 30 to 35 degrees below zero. And if that happens, that barrel is going to be a lot colder than that. That barrel could be as low as 50 degrees below zero. And to demonstrate that, I want to show you something. Take a look at this picture. Do you see the ice on the rubber seal that's just under the door? That is a really good sign. If you see ice forming there, oh, happy day, because that means that your refrigeration unit is working very, very well, and that metal part of the barrel that's in that little groove in that seal is getting so cold that it is causing the rubber on that seal to form um, condensation on it and then it's getting cold enough to freeze that condensation. So this is a very good sign. When I, when I brought my freeze dryer back from the shop and plugged it in and, and started it up, I noticed that ice and I was overjoyed because I knew that, that things were working as they should. Okay, so anyhow, it goes into a freezing cycle and it'll do that until the temperature, you can, here's, here's a picture of it, the temperature is going to get down to well below 20 below zero and I believe this is after five hours and it was at minus 23 but you can be sure that that barrel got down a lot colder than that okay and this uh, this temperature actually did get colder I think this temperature got down to minus 35 degrees uh, the tray inside before it went into what is called the vacuum freezing cycle. Now, what happens here is the vacuum will turn on, and the, your vacuum pump will turn on, but it won't, and it'll draw a, uh, a vacuum inside your barrel, but the trays won't start heating up. And I'm, I'm not really sure why that does that, because the, theoretically the barrel can't cool the tray anymore because there's a vacuum between the two of them. However, I do believe it is so that the barrel can reach its optimum um, efficiency, its, its lowest temperature, without being affected by the tray and the food on the tray. And that's important because you want that differential between the barrel and the tray. So it'll go into a vacuum freeze for a little while. And as you can see here, um, during vacuum freezing, it started vacuum freezing, I was at minus 29 degrees below zero. And um, you notice the, it, the vacuum pressure is down to 662 millitors, which is the sublimation range, okay? There is some sublimation going on here. But as the temperature of the tray becomes, uh, starts to equilibrate between the temperature of the off gases, and that's something else you need to consider, the vapor, you can have vapor floating around in a vacuum, and that vapor is going to affect both the vacuum level and it's going to affect the temperature of the tray because the, the cold from the barrel can actually travel through the vapor and affect the temperature of the tray. 
the computer, onboard computer in your freeze dryer monitors this very, very closely. So let's look at this next screen. Here you can see that the vacuum pressure got down to below 534 or 530 millitors. And that tells the computer that it's time to start warming the tray and to start drying or, for, or start drying the food that's in there. Because at 530 millitors, there's no sublimation going on. All right? Or there's very, very little. The, that vacuum pump is able to keep that vacuum way down. So what the uh, computer will do is it'll start to warm the trays. Now you can see here that the computer has warmed it up to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And this has been after 15 hours total in the machine, but after only one hour and four minutes, about one hour and five minutes uh, into the drying cycle. Now the temperature kept going up because the computer was monitoring that vacuum level and it wasn't rising. It was staying at below uh, 540, 530 millitors. And so the computer was raising the temperature of the trays. Now I have to tell you, during the batch that was in there during this cycle, um, I had some frozen chicken in there and I didn't have a lot. Okay, there was, there was, um, there was probably less than eight pounds in all four trays. And because of that, sublimation wasn't able to affect the, the vacuum as readily as it would if your trays were completely full and had a lot of moisture on them. Uh, this all would have happened a lot faster. But there you can see 64 degrees at 534 millitors. And then even at, so the, 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 the tray kept getting warmer. There's 66 degrees, 537. All right, 74 degrees, there is when sublimation was beginning. Because as the ice sublimates and turns into a vapor, it affects the vacuum levels. Now you might say, Evan, um, is that really that much of a vacuum difference? Well, considering that where I live, at the elevation I'm at, uh, millitors is over 200,000 millitors. Okay, so when you're getting down to between five and seven hundred millitors, you're almost at absolute vacuum. It's almost outer space. And the difference between 500 and 700 is paper thin. But the computer on your freeze dryer is sophisticated enough that it can read and reacts to temperature differences between 500 and 700. Now, it doesn't have to be 5 and 7. In your area, in your atmosphere, it might be between 4 and 6. In some others, it might be between 6 and 8. For where I live, the vacuum um, level between no sublimation and sublimation being affected is only 200 millitors. So anyhow, in this picture, you see at 74 degrees, it finally warmed the air around the ice sufficiently that it began to sublimate. And when it began to sublimate, it began to increase or decrease the vacuum up to 618 millitors. And then it kind of held it there. Now, what will happen is when the ice starts to sublimate, the computer will shut off the heat to the trays and it'll just let the process happen naturally. And what will happen is the trays will begin to cool off a little bit because of the water vapor that's, that's between the barrel and the trays. And as the trays begin to cool off a little bit, the sublimation is going to decrease and therefore the vacuum is going to increase back down to 450 or whatever. And the computer is monitoring that. And when that vacuum level drops down to 400 and you know, whatever it is, 450, 430, it will turn on the heat to the trays and it'll continue to increase the heat to the trays until sublimation uh, levels are reestablished. And it'll do that up and down and up and down and up and down with the temperatures. The thing is, every time it has to raise the temperature, it'll have to raise it a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And if you'll take a look at this picture, this one is in final dry. It's almost finished. It's probably only got two or three more hours of final dry, but you'll notice the temperature is at 114 degrees and the vacuum level is down to 415. And what that tells the computer is that sublimation isn't happening anymore. Okay, so you might ask yourself, Evan, then why does it go into a final dry? Why doesn't it just stop the cycle then? Well, inside your food, in the very center, whatever it is you've got on your trays, there can still be water vapor. Now what happens to that water vapor as it 
dissipates into that area, into that vacuum area, is it comes in contact with the inside of the barrel. And the inside of that barrel is still way below zero. And when it comes in contact with the inside of the barrel, it condenses back into ice. In other words, then it turns from a vapor directly back into ice on the inside of the barrel. But it doesn't happen onto the food because the food is no longer cold enough to cause that kind of condensation and frosting over. So all that water being sucked out of the food is now ending up on the inside of the barrel as in the form of a sheet of ice. Now your final dry time is determined, you can set that um, on your screen. All right. So um, when the computer determines that sublimation has ceased and goes into final dry, heats that tray up to between 114 and 125 degrees. It'll let it sit there for however much time that you have determined and put into its its final dry time in the startup of the customized screen. Okay, now once that is all finished, the process will end. You'll get the screen up that says, okay, it's all done. You release the vacuum and take the food out and do whatever you want to do with it. But when you take the food out, now this is important, you take the thickest piece of food that was on there, be it a piece of meat, be it a piece of casserole, be it a piece of whatever, and you break it in half. And then you put your finger right in the middle. Now, if it's just cold, it means that there was still water vapor inside the middle of your food. It's not fluid. It's still a water vapor. And you need to get that out of there because that water vapor will eventually condense back into a liquid. Not very much. I mean, it's just a trace amount. But that could affect the longevity or the ability to, of your food to store for a long time. So... For me, I don't put the food back in the freeze dryer. I will take the food and I will put it in my dehydrator and let the dehydrator finish it off. Now, I don't recommend that you do that unless you're experienced, unless you know what the food should look like, how it should feel, what the uh, temperature of the center should be. Some people even have a, um, a moisture sensor that they will stick into their food. It will tell them how much moisture is in there. And if there's any moisture in the middle of your food, you need to get it out of there. Uh, so for most people, I recommend just putting it back in your freeze dryer, and then there will, you will have the option of increasing or adding more um, final dry time to it. And usually it's between two, four, six hours, but you can adjust that. And again, experience will tell you that. But I don't like to do that because I don't have to, because I have enough experience. I know when it's okay to take that food and put it in the dehydrator, and that saves hours of wear and tear on the machine okay on my freeze dryer so that's and I'm, I've made a video about that and and uh, it works I do it all the time uh, I've never had a problem with it and you can't tell you virtually can't tell the difference between food that has gone 100 percent of the time in the freeze dryer and food that has been had the uh, the vapor evacuated out of it in a dehydrator you can compare the two together and, and look at the one of the two you won't be able to tell the difference and it doesn't have any effect on the enzymic level, it doesn't have any effect on the uh, nutrients uh, because you put it in your dehydrator at very low temperatures. I, I put mine in there at 80 degrees for about two and a half to three hours and it finishes the process just fine. Uses a lot less energy and uh, a lot less wear and tear than you would putting it back in the freeze dryer. Now, if you take that food and you break it in half and you touch the middle and you can feel moisture. In other words, the middle of the food is still a little bit soft. That means that you still got liquid in there. Yes. Then that food goes back in the freeze dryer. I do not try to get rid of that liquid in a dehydrator. That goes back into the uh, freeze dryer and I add four hours onto it and I check it again after four hours and I keep doing that until I can either finish it up on the dehydrator or until the food is warm all the way through. Now this brings up another point. I've had people ask me, do you have to be right there as soon as the batch finishes to take the food out immediately? Well, the answer is no. If you need to come back you know, several hours later, if you're at work or something, and you're not going to be able to take the food out of the freeze dryer until uh, long after the batch ends, um, you can do that. That's perfectly okay, because when the batch ends, the freeze dryer will shut down the vacuum pump, and it will shut down the 
uh, tray warmer, okay? But it will not shut down the refrigeration unit. And that's uh, something to consider when you want to test to see if there's any water vapor or moisture left in the center of your food when you crack it in half. Because if the food sits in the freeze dryer with the refrigeration unit running for a couple of hours, then that warm tray is now, the temperature of that warm tray, because there's no more vacuum, is going to drop down to the temperature of the barrel. And so that means that your food is going to be cold all the way through. And so when you crack it in half, you can, you can tell if there's moisture in there because it'll be soft but you won't be able to tell if you know you've got trace vapors or trace amounts of water inside the food okay so it's best if you do um, if you are there within I would say a half an hour to an hour after the uh, the batch is finished so that you can test for for, for moisture but um, you don't have to worry about running home or, or being right there when the batch finishes because the, uh, the freeze dryer will hold the food in a frozen state until you take it out and initiate the, uh, the defrost process. Now you can, if, if that's going to happen a lot, you can get yourself a digital um, moisture tester. It has two little prongs on it. I don't have one myself. But, um, and you'll stick it right in the food and it'll tell you if there's any moisture there. So if you're ever concerned that you don't know for one reason or another if the food has any moisture left in it, get yourself a digital tester and that way you never have to be wrong and you can be absolutely sure 100% of the time what the moisture content of your food is. And if it's freeze dried, um, there should be zero moisture. And Properly freeze-dried food, if you take it out of the freeze-dryer, as soon as the batch is done, when you break the food in half, it should be warm all the way through it. There should be no cold or no soft spot in the middle of the food. It should be as warm in the middle as it is on the outside. Now you might ask yourself, why would there be water vapor on the inside of the food? And here is where the thickness of the food that you put in your freeze dryer becomes very, very important. You should never put food in your freeze dryer that is thicker than three quarters of an inch. Because what happens is what I call the blanket effect. And I, I, I use that term uh, with sugars and, and syrups and stuff like that. And the reason that you can't freeze dry them is because what happens is the outside of the substance freeze dries or becomes hard and it prevents the moisture from the inside from escaping. And that will happen to a certain extent. It doesn't prevent it from escaping with food in the freeze dryer, uh, food that you can freeze dry. But what it will do is it'll prevent it, it'll make it difficult. Okay, so you got that food, it's three quarters of an inch thick, but that, that right in the middle of the food, whatever you're freeze drying, is going to be blanketed by the dry food on top of it and on the bottom of it and on the sides of it and that little bit of moisture in there even though it's still in a vacuum and the ice has sublimated off it can't escape sufficiently to get to that barrel and refreeze back into ice so it stays in the middle of your food that's why it is very important to check your food even after the freeze dryer says it's done because the freeze dryer has no way of knowing if your food still has moisture or vapor right in the middle of it if that moisture or vapor can't get out and sublimate and dry um, on the inside or freeze on the inside of the barrel okay so you, you've got to watch out for that so anyhow um, once your food has been anywhere from 120 to 125 degrees for several hours or seven and a half hours uh, the, the freeze dryer cycle will finish. You need to check to see if you've got any vapor. Remember, if it's cold, it's vapor. If it's wet, it'll be soft. It'll be spongy. Okay? And for me, if it's cold and just vapor, the freeze, my dehydrator does a wonderful job of getting rid of that. If it's got any water, moisture in it, that's not vapor, it goes back in the freeze dryer. That's important if you're going to be successful at storing your food for 25 to 30 years or more. All right, let's talk a little bit about what happened to me when I first got my freeze dryer. Well, 
Well, okay, let's back up a little bit and let's talk about what you should find when you open up that door to your freeze dryer, okay? I want you to look at this picture. There is a picture of that ice sheet of water that has been sublimated off the food that was in there and then recondensed as ice on the inside of the barrel, okay? This is what you have to defrost out of your unit. Um, it takes a couple of hours. Uh, for it to defrost it out of, out of the unit, what happens? It goes into a drain valve in the in the very back of the unit and down into a uh, a plastic hose that you have in a bucket or something. But I want you to notice here where that ice is. That ice is within an inch of that rubber ring, and that is exactly what you want to find. Okay, that means that your uh, your refrigeration unit is working well. That means the entire barrel on the inside is cooling front to back okay and that's important because if your refrigeration unit isn't working right you won't find this okay and in this picture you see my hand my hand is in front of the trays now those trays are warm remember those those trays were being held at 114 120 degrees right around in there for seven hours Okay, those, uh, and they were warm, but you notice the ice hasn't melted. And remember I said that radiant heat can't travel through a vacuum? Okay, so the trays are warm, the ice and the barrel is still very, very cold. You can touch that ice and it is, you can still tell that it's well below zero. But the fact is, that barrel had a vacuum in it for that entire time. That it's only a couple of inches between that rack and the outside of the barrel but because it had a vacuum the heat of that tray could not affect the temperature of the barrel that's why you have to have a, a vacuum that is uh, able to get down to you know less than 400 millitors as a matter of fact when I test my vacuum um, I've actually been able to get that vacuum down to about 230 millitors, which is phenomenal. Uh, you might as well be in outer space. Okay, so let's look at this next picture here. I want to show you one of the error messages that I got before I had to send my unit into the shop to have it checked out. I actually, after 54 hours, and the temperature only got up to 88 degrees Fahrenheit, something was wrong and the computer knew it and I got this error message the process although I, I canceled it myself the process was complete at least because I canceled it it went into the process complete but if you'll notice 88 degrees Fahrenheit 54 uh, 54 hours and I what I had in there was only water I was working with technical support and he asked me to do a water batch so I didn't have anything on the trays this system should have finished in less than 24 25 hours okay even even as short as 19 or 20 hours because it was only water in the trays and I did that water batch and it ended up being over 54 hours and only 88 degrees Fahrenheit and so I went ahead and canceled it and I opened it up and there was still frozen water on the trays. Uh, there was some melted water on the trays. Something was wrong. And so I took my unit and I, I only live about 40 miles from the Harvest Rights Manufacturing Center and Sales Center. And so I was able to take it down there and they were able to work on it and fix it. Okay. So there was my first red flag. Here's my second red flag. See this picture? When I opened up the freeze dryer and took those trays out of there, you see where that ice level is? That ice level should have been all the way to the front, just like that first picture I showed you. The ice was within an inch of that rubber. My ice level, when I took those trays out, was, was a good six or eight inches away. So there was my second red flag. I knew then that something was seriously wrong. Okay. I also got this error message um, as I was working with it. It said not getting cold enough. It said see the troubleshooting guide in section number six or um, get on the Harvest Right website and it showed you what to do um, if you were to see that error message. So that was that was another thing and that, that kept happening. That happened a couple times. Okay, again, here's another picture of what the eye should look like. 
And here's the picture of what the ice looks like when you have uh, refrigeration problems. Okay? So now, if your temperatures are right, if your freeze dryer is acting the way it should, uh, but you have questions about its operation and its temperatures, let's go through the screen here and let me show you where the hidden button is. Now, mind you, um, I've got the latest firmware, at least my firmware is the 5.0.15 which is the latest one as of this recording. Uh, depending upon when you're watching it, you might have an updated one, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you through this and I'm gonna show you. Here's what the screen looks like when it's ready to start, okay? There's the start button right there. And when you press the start button, well, it just, it takes you through starting it. Um, I'm not gonna get into that. But you also have this customize button. And when you press this customize button, you're gonna get this screen, okay? So up here, is the initial freeze. Now, default is minus 10 degrees, but I like to set mine up to minus 20 degrees because I like to make sure that my food is good and frozen solid because I'm a heavy user. I do a lot of experimentation, so I like the fact that it gets down to where it needs to be. All right, now, so I change it to minus 20. I leave the extra dry time at seven hours and 30 minutes. You can lessen that if you want but uh, I usually leave it there because I will, I will actually cancel the cycle. Once, once I see that that temperature remains at 115 to 120 degrees for a couple of hours, I know that it's in final dry, and I will actually cancel the cycle and check it. And a lot of times I'll find that I just have a little water vapor in the middle of the food. That's when it goes to the freeze or the dehydrator. Um, but for the machine parameters, I will leave the extra dry time at seven hours and 30 minutes and the dry temperature I will leave at 120 degrees Fahrenheit because that that is the most efficiency and then I'll hit the save button okay now that uh, once you get back to the home screen I'm going to show you now where the hidden button is and I'm not quite sure why harvest right hides the button and makes it so that people at first glance don't readily know it's there but you see that harvest right logo if you touch that harvest right logo you're gonna get this screen and this is your function testing screen this is where you can turn off the freezer unit by pressing this button here or you can turn on and off your tray heater and it will tell you what the tray heater temperature is uh, as it's raising up I believe the tray heater will get up to 135 degrees before it stops getting any hotter because that's the temperature it gets up to when you're in defrost mode. And then you've got this one here. This is, you can turn on and off your vacuum. And if you've got a, uh, um, an oilless vacuum, you're going to want to occasionally turn that vacuum on and off to evacuate it. That's also the button you're going to want to use to control your vacuum pump if you are using your freeze dryer as a um, vacuum packer. I do that all the time. I've made a video on exactly how you can do that. You can, you can vacuum pack bags, you can vacuum pack jars, and, uh, and it'll be a tight vacuum pack too. It'll be a commercial quality vacuum pack. So that screen has a lot that you can do with it, a lot of, uh, you know, the three buttons to check out and see if the three major components of your freeze dryer are working properly, the uh, vacuum pump, the heater tray, and the refrigeration unit. Now this one is your auxiliary relay. The relay is not hooked up to anything. I think the engineers did that as a just-in-case measure, just in case they want the computer to be able to control something else. Uh, that they haven't figured out yet what they want to put on there. Just in case they, somebody comes up with a bright idea and says, well, let's, let's have the freeze dryer also control this other thing here, and they're going to hook it up to the auxiliary relay. So just leave that off. Don't play with it. Don't do anything with it because it doesn't do anything. Okay? It just happens to be there. Now, there's something else that you probably noticed on your freeze dryer. Maybe you haven't. But on the right side up towards the top, you're going to see a USB port. And here's a picture of it. And the reason that that USB port is there is so that you can record your log files if your um, 
service tech wants to take a look at them. And you've also used that U USB port to update your firmware, and it's really easy to do. You heard me mention a water batch before. Now, if you're having problems with your freeze dryer and you call tech support, he'll have you do a water batch. And what that is, is he'll have you take empty trays and put a quarter of a cup of water, a half a cup of water in each one, load them into your freeze dryer, and run the batch. It should only take 19 to 24 hours to finish up uh, that small of a batch. But that's a known value. And tech support will be able to look at your log files and tell if there's anything amiss. Um, with your freeze dryer or he'll be able to tell you if everything is working fine and then you'll have to go from there okay but if you want to update your firmware and he'll generally have you do that too the, um, or you can call Harvest Right and have them send you um, your updated firmware file or your tech support will send it to you and you load that file onto a jump drive um, a blank one an empty jump drive and you'll plug that jump drive into the side of your freeze dryer and what happens is you turn your freeze dryer off or you make sure it's off when you plug the jump drive into there and you turn the freeze dryer on and the first thing the computer on the freeze dryer will do is it'll look to see if there's something plugged in if there's nothing there it just moves on and, and starts things going but if there's a jump drive there it'll look for an updated firmware file and if it finds one, it'll update itself. There's nothing more you have to do. It's easy as can be. And then it'll move on, and you can take the jump drive out. However, if the tech support wants the log files, you turn off your freeze dryer, you plug that jump drive into there. It needs to be blank. You turn on your freeze dryer, and again, the computer will look to see if there's a jump drive. If there is a jump drive in there, but there's no update file, it'll proceed to record the log files onto the jump drive. Then you can turn off your freeze dryer, unplug the jump drive, and take the files, and there'll be a whole bunch of them. There'll be seven or eight of them, or maybe even more. And tech support's going to want to see those. So you send all those. They're not great big. They're, they're small. They're easy to send via email. Also, your tech support will probably want you to take pictures of the inside of your barrel to see where that ice sheet is, to see if there's any abnormalities. He's going to want to see pictures of the tray to make sure that all the water was off the trays and everything. So between pictures and copies of your log files sent to him via email, he can help you determine if there's something wrong with your machine over a long distance and what, what you need to do uh, from that point on. Now, it's my understanding, and I may be wrong, that if you're a long ways away, he's not going to ask you to box up your freeze dryer and, and, and ship it back to them. That can cost a lot of money. But if you're out of warranty and something goes wrong, you can have an HVAC technician come in and contact tech support. And they will tell him exactly what he needs to look at and exactly what he needs to do to uh, to fix your machine. At that point, it usually has something to do with the refrigeration unit. Like I say, on my unit, they ended up having to replace the condenser unit. It had a it had a stuck or froze valve in it that was causing a high pressure error. And if the problem happens to be a bad relay on your circuit board or your computer board or something like that what will happen is the technician will simply send you a new one if it's out of warranty um, it'll cost I don't know seventy or eighty dollars but uh, they're easy to replace everything's just plug in you, you take the top off your freeze dryer which means taking the back off first but there's just a few screws and you're able to access that board because it's going to be right there it's not down deep into the guts of the freeze dryer but with your freeze dryer unplugged then you just go ahead and you you unplug all the plugs on that circuit board and then you put the new circuit board in there and you just plug the plugs in the same place and you're done so that's that's real easy and I've had to do that one time when I had a relay go bad but fortunately I was in warranty and uh, so it didn't cost me anything so um, that's what that USB ports for and that's generally what will happen if you need to have somebody work on your machine and you're living all the way across country or or wherever they will work via an HVAC tech but it's something that you you're going to have to figure out how to do but I'm quite sure that Harvest Ride has a method of taking care of you in such an event
To kind of recap here, you now know that the freeze dryer um, eliminates ice by evaporating it without first going into its liquid state. Because if it did, if it went into its liquid state before it evaporated, you'd have a um, dehydrator, okay? But in your freeze dryer, the ice actually evaporates, and that doesn't affect the quality, the texture, the size, or anything of the food, okay? Secondly, your freeze dryer will monitor its vacuum levels very, very closely and to a very slim tolerances, and that way your freeze dryer is able to determine if you're in sublimation or if you are... Um, the ice is all gone, so there's no more sublimation, and it does that by monitoring the vacuum level. And even though the computer may think the food is done, there still could be some vapor on the inside of your food, which will mean the outside of the food will be warm, but that inside will still be cold because of the water vapor inside. Or it could be wet, meaning that you need to put the food back in the freeze dryer for four, you know, for two or four or six hours or whatever. Uh, to get that food completely dry. So there you have it. Freeze drying is not difficult. I have told you here things that you need to watch out for, things that you need to monitor to see to make sure that your freeze dryer is operating properly. Uh, temperature and vacuum are the two most important that you can monitor um, while the freeze dryer is operating. When I first got my freeze dryer, my batches were taken anywhere from 45 to 60 hours. And I didn't know that that was a problem. I had never talked with anybody else about freeze drying. Like I say, it didn't come with a manual that explained all this. And so I thought that was normal. So for two hours, I'm running around telling everybody, yeah, I put in a lot of food and, and uh, it takes 45, 48, 60 hours. And I think I had one batch one time that took 65 hours which it will do. It, it did freeze dry the food very, very well, but it took a long, long time to do it. And I was confused because people were telling me, I had a few people, a few followers telling me that they were doing, one, one gal that is a follower of mine, she says, Evan, I do, uh, I do batches of peaches, only takes 24 hours. And I'm going, well, that must have something to do with elevation or it must have something to do with, with, uh, you know, uh, the vacuum, uh, the amount of food, maybe she's only putting a one peach an inch apart or something. I, I, I simply made excuses. Don't put your food in there thicker than three quarters of an inch. That little quarter of an inch difference can make a difference between how much the food will insulate the middle, its, its own middle and not allow that water vapor to escape. So now I make sure that I never put my food in the freeze dryer more than three quarters of an inch thick. If your batches are taken more than 40 hours, something's wrong. But just pay attention. If your batches are taken 35 to 40 hours, look at what you're putting in there. Look at how tightly you're packing it. Maybe there's too much moisture in there. There could be a lot of reasons. Adjust things, pay attention. And with that, I'll ask you to like and subscribe. I'm sure there's a lot of people uh, with freeze dryers that could benefit from hearing what I'm teaching you right now. Um, hit that notification bell because I, I do have more videos coming out. And for heaven's sakes, have a good time freeze drying. You spend a lot of money on that freeze dryer. Use it because they will last a long time. And if what happened to me doesn't happen to you, which they ended up replacing the condenser unit because they had a frozen valve in it. But anyhow, like, share, and hit the notification bell. And as a professional photographer, I, I, I think you notice this backdrop keeps changing. Uh, that I'm in my studio right now, and I use different backdrops, and this is just a backdrop. I like it. There's my gallery address. Visit my gallery. I really appreciate having people visit my gallery, leave a comment, tell me what they think, and um, it just it kind of makes this all worthwhile. So with that, I'm Evan Rowell. And this is critical thinking about freeze dryer operation.